So the next type of enzyme inhibitors we are going to be looking at is the non-competitive inhibitors. Non-competitive inhibitors are molecules that do not compete with the substrates to bind with the active site. Instead of binding with the active site, they will actually attach to something known as the allosteric site of the enzyme, which is the site that is not the active site. I'm putting it over here, and the one where I've highlighted in purple is the allosteric site, right there. You don't have to know the term allosteric site, but it's good to just understand that such parts of the enzymes also exist as well. So the substrate is complementary to the active site, and the non-competitive inhibitor, which is this small little purplish thing that I'm drawing there, look at the shape of the non-competitive inhibitor. Is it able to bind to the active site? No. In fact, it doesn't actually need to do so. So what happens then is it will actually bind to the allosteric site or the site other than the active site. Now, what's the big deal if it binds with the allosteric site? You see, when it attaches to the allosteric site of the enzyme, it will actually disrupt hydrogen bonds and weak hydrophobic interactions within the enzyme. You see, these bonds were supposed to maintain the 3D structure of the enzymes together with ionic bonds and disulfide bridges. But when these two bonds are disrupted by the inhibitor, what will actually happen then is the shape of the enzyme is altered. Now look what happens when the 3D shape of the enzyme is changed. Look at what happens to the active site. The substrate is no longer able to bind to the active site and therefore no ES complexes can be formed. And in this case over here, the enzyme activity is reduced or prevented. That is what is known as a non-competitive inhibitor. It will bind to the allosteric site or the site other than the active site, cause a disruption of hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions in the enzymes, change the 3D structure of the enzymes, preventing the substrates from binding with the active site of the enzyme. So no ES complexes will form. So in this case over here, it's quite straightforward. And for competitive inhibitor, it binds with the active site, but for non-competitive inhibitor, it binds to the allosteric site or the site other than the active site. It is important to know that in the exam, you do not have to use the word allosteric site. You can just say that the non-competitive inhibitor binds to a site which is not the active site the inhibition is also reversible. Reversible in the sense where the inhibitor will bind to the, the non-competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme, changes its shape, but eventually it can also detach. And when the non-competitive inhibitor detaches from the enzyme, the shape of the enzyme returns to normal. So this is what is meant by reversible non-competitive inhibitors. So the next thing we want to know is, Will increasing the substrate concentration affect the non-competitive inhibitors? If you remember in the previous video, when you increase the concentration of substrates, competitive inhibitor effects will reduce because the competitive inhibitors and the substrates are fighting for the same site. So will the same effect happen with non-competitive inhibitors? Let's take a look. So I have the enzyme. I am I'm doing I'm conducting two experiments over here. You can see this orange color thing. Those are enzymes. The green color triangle is the substrate. And I'm going to represent the non-competitive inhibitor as a blue dot. So the experiment on the left is done without inhibitors, and the experiment on the right is done with the non-competitive inhibitors. Now, let's do a quick experiment for this. So Without inhibitor, if I have 1% substrate, what will be the initial rate of reaction? The initial rate of reaction is 1. If I have 2% substrates, obviously the initial rate of reaction is 2 because they can bind to the enzyme. If I have 3% substrates, then the initial rate of reaction is 3 
all right and if i have four percent substrates the initial weight of reaction is four as usual and if i were to have five percent substrate what is the initial rate of reaction the initial rate of reaction is still four because of the limited concentration of enzymes and this value is referred to as the value of v max because you cannot make the initial rate of reaction any higher due to the limited number or concentration of enzymes that you have in this case so that's just a quick experiment now for the non-competitive inhibitors however i'm going to put two non-competitive inhibitors the two blue dots I'm going to label it as NCI. Please, in the exam, do not say NCI. It is non-competitive inhibitors. I'm just a little lazy, okay? So cut me some slack. Um, and in this situation here, if I have 1% substrate, in this case here, what will actually happen is the substrate will then bind to the enzyme quite easily. If I have 2% substrates, it can also bind to the enzyme, no problems, everything so far so good. But here's where it becomes interesting. At 3%, notice something very interesting. Earlier, actually, the non-competitive inhibitor had bound to the allosteric side of those two enzymes, which I've represented in the blue arrow. So what will actually happen is those two enzymes, which I've highlighted in pink now, are no longer occupied. So the third substrate particle will not be able to attach to the enzyme, right? Because the 3D structure of the enzyme is changed. So only the enzymes highlighted in yellow can be used in this reaction. So in this case, what has actually happened is the, the initial rate of reaction is just two. So what has actually happened here is the Vmax has reduced. Even when I try to put 4% substrates, the substrate is no longer able to bind to the enzyme. So you see, what has actually happened to the Vmax over here? The Vmax over here has significantly lowered due to the non-competitive inhibitors. So the presence of more substrates will not be able to fight off the non-competitive inhibitors at all you will not be able to reach the original Vmax value, where I'm just circling over here, you will not be able to reach that Vmax value at all, no matter how many substrates you add to the reaction. So you see here, I'm adding as much substrate as possible, 10% substrates, will they be able to have a, a higher chance of binding to the enzyme? No, because the non-competitive inhibitors can still just easily bind to the allosteric site and when they bind to the allosteric site the initial rate of reaction is only two so this is the effect of non-competitive inhibitors on the vmax value on the initial rate of reaction and the vmax value non-competitive inhibitors will lower the vmax value so you see with competitive inhibitors this is from the previous video right 5% substrate on the left side was able to reach Vmax, but with competitive inhibitors, you need a 10% substrate to reach the same Vmax value. So if you wanted to reduce the chances of the inhibitors binding to the enzyme, you just had to increase the substrate concentration. But with non-competitive inhibitors, no matter how many substrates you put, the Vmax value will not be achieved at that point high original value as it was without the inhibitors because the substrate concentration will not have any effect on the non-competitive inhibitors at all. So as you can see here, this is a graph that is showing you the difference between the competitive inhibitors and also non-competitive inhibitors. With competitive inhibitors, you are still able to reach the original Vmax value However, it requires more substrates. But with non-competitive inhibitors, however, the Vmax value is always lowered, no matter what. So then comes the more important question, are non-competitive inhibitors good? If you remember when we were talking about competitive inhibitors, I told you that there are some benefits of competitive inhibition as well, when I was mentioning the antifreeze and ethanol. 
And non-competitive inhibition, it might look dangerous as well. You might think, oh, it's also reducing the enzyme activity, so it must be dangerous. But not necessarily as well. In fact, non-competitive inhibition does happen naturally in our body under normal circumstances. So you might be thinking, oh, okay, this is a bit of an interesting snippet. Now, one thing I want you to understand is a lot of chemical reactions in our cells are actually chain reactions. You don't have to memorize this fact, but I just want to show it to you. For example, you might have molecule A, which is a substrate. To convert molecule A into molecule D, which is an end product, you cannot just instantly make it from A to D. It has to go through a series of steps. A will become molecule B, molecule B is converted to molecule C, and molecule C will then be converted into D, which is the end product, right? And each arrow will represent a chemical reaction catalyzed by a specific enzyme. For example, A to B is catalyzed by enzyme 1, B to C is enzyme 2, which is slightly different, and C to D is enzyme 3, which are slightly different as well and I'm going to represent it over here. So as you can see, A binds to the active site of enzyme 1, gets converted into B, B binds into active site of enzyme 2, gets converted into C, and C binds to active site of enzyme 3 and gets converted into D. And I'm just going to draw molecule D as like this cloudy yellow things. Now while it is important to form end products, too much end products may be harmful in the cell. I don't need you to memorize this, but I want you to understand this. For example, let's say the end product is hydrogen ions. Your cells may need hydrogen ions, but too much hydrogen ions can be dangerous because the presence of excess hydrogen ions may cause the cytoplasm to become too acidic and the cell might die. So you see, it's one of those balancing effects where you must have some of the hydrogen ion, but not too much. So how does the cell ensure that not too much hydrogen ions are being produced? So how does the cell regulate the production of the end product? So here is where something very beautiful happens. If you notice, I'm just looking at enzyme 1. I'm just redrawing enzyme 1 and magnifying it. Notice the active site. Active site looks pretty normal, but I'm also going to draw that allosteric site. It looks like that very squiggly shape. I'm also going to redraw molecule D as well. Okay, so what do you notice over there, by the way? You notice something very interesting. Molecule D, which is an end product, can bind to the allosteric site of enzyme number one. Now, is this good or is this bad? You might be thinking, oh, this is bad because it is going to inhibit the enzyme. But in this case, it's fantastic that it does so. Because when it inhibits enzyme number one, look at the shape of the active site, it's no longer able to be complementary to molecule A anymore. So will any more molecule A get converted to molecule B? No, the reaction will stop. And when the reaction stops, there will be less molecule B there'll be less molecule C, and eventually no more molecule Ds are being produced. So the production of end product in this case is halted. In this case, it is good to stop the production of the end products because, like I told you earlier, we don't want too much end products. We want some, but not too much of it. Just like everything in life, sadly. Okay, like I love... Oh my God, I love ice cream. I just do, but uh, I, I just can't have too much of it, okay? That's the sad fact. Now, anyway, so coming back to... So the end product will inhibit the enzymes non-competitively. And this, and, this, and this is good for two reasons. Number one, you will prevent the end product concentration from being too much. But number two also, you are not using up all the substrates. So the substrates can be kept for the future when the cell needs to use it, only when necessary. This is an example of something known as end product inhibition. So let's try it again. Now, in this example over here, your body needs two types of amino acids. Your body needs threonine, 
or THR and isoleucine, which is ISO. Now, here's something very interesting as well. Even though your body needs both these amino acids, if you only were to eat threonine, your liver can convert some of the threonine into isoleucine. So your body will have a good amount of threonine and isoleucine as well. When you look at this chemical reaction over here, now I want you to see this chemical reaction. Do you want all the threonine to be converted into isoleucine? The answer is no, because I told you your body needs both. Your body needs threonine for protein synthesis. Your body also needs isoleucine for protein synthesis. So you must not use up all the threonine and convert it into isoleucine. You must have a good uh, you must have a good amount of both amino acids. So how does the body, number one, make enough isoleucine, but also keep threonine for future use? Here's where non-competitive inhibition helps. So I'm going to show you a situation over here. So I have the isoleucine. So some of the isoleucine, what exactly happens is it binds with the active site, and then it gets converted into the end product, which is isoleucine. And the end products over here, notice, they will bind to the allosteric site of the enzyme. What happens to the shape of the enzyme? The 3D structure of the enzyme is altered. And when the 3D structure of the enzyme is altered, will any more of the substrates be converted into the end products? No, it won't you will actually keep them for the future. So this is good for two reasons. You prevent the concentration of end products from increasing drastically, and you also maintain the concentration of the substrates for future use. This is a beautiful example of end product inhibition. So end product inhibition is what happens when the end product will non-competitively bind to an enzyme, deliberately, I might add, we want this to happen, so that it will stop the chemical reactions from taking place. The reason is because we want to prevent the concentration of end products from increasing too much, and we also want to maintain the concentration of substrates for future use. This is also very important to know for the exam.